our show and tell this morning is, I think, a picture from when I was confirmed many, many years ago, uh, back when that guy on the right was not much older than I am right now. And um, because uh, this is a family business, uh, many of you know the guy on the right there. Uh, that's my dad, who was my confirmation teacher, as so often happens for pastor's kids. Um, and now I know I have talked about confirmation class at like every turn for the last month. And I, I promise I will quit soon. Um, but I, I have to acknowledge, like, confirmation class, which starts this evening, uh, confirmation class is hitting me a little bit harder this year than it often does because I have a kid in confirmation class this year, which means I've hit, like, a whole brand new life stage. Confirmation class knows a couple of truths. Uh, one, uh, one truth that confirmation class knows is that most of our kids learn faith from us in church before they make it to that confirmation age. And the other truth is that our kids learn a lot more than we think we're teaching them on the way to that time. Uh, so confirmation is a thing that happens because growing up is complicated. And so we have to sort of come to this point and say, okay, we're at this stage, we're going to reorganize everything that we know and think and uh, put new words on it, we hope. Um, and this also happens at this particular age and every generation because God's promises never look the same to two different people. So the two people in that picture right up there on the screen today God's promises do not look the same to those people. I can tell you that with a good deal of authority. And what's amazing is that some months from now, when I have a picture just like this, where I'm the old one in the picture, God's promises don't look the same to those two people either, or to any two of us as we sit here because God's promises are new and situated the way that they are in the particular lives that we find ourselves in. So as we move into our scripture reading today, we have been following the story of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, whom God has promised to give children God has promised to make Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a great nation. And it has been a year since Abraham and Sarah have last heard from God. It's been 24 years since the first time Abraham and Sarah heard this promise that God would make them the ancestors of nations. It's been 24 years and they still have no children until today's story. Well, small qualifier, because today's story comes in two parts, and you'll get confused otherwise. Abraham did have a son already uh, with an enslaved woman in his household named Hagar, and that son's name is Ishmael. We will hear about them later on. I'm going to hold them off for a moment so that we can hear this, the part of the story that is about Sarah. So will you join me for a prayer for illumination? God of mercy, your covenant with us is never broken. Amid all the changing words of our time, speak your eternal word that does not change. As we hear, may we respond to your promise and your call with lives of faithfulness and blessing through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first part of the scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. 
Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a little more to the scripture reading this morning that I wanted to give us time to sit with the joyful story that we began with and, and celebrate this gift of time to worship and praise the Lord. Because the story goes on and it gets messy and complicated really fast as stories in the Bible tend to do as stories in our world tend to do. So Isaac has just been born and the story continues. The child grew and was weaned and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, but God said to Abraham, Don't be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This, too, is the word of the Lord. That family may seem familiar to some of you. You may have grown up in a family that was like that. In a lot of families, someone has to be excluded in order for the family to work. Maybe it was you, maybe it was someone else in your family. Maybe they were explicitly disowned like Hagar and Ishmael in today's story, this second complicated part of the story. More often than being like explicitly disowned, they may be just sort of subtly pushed out. It might be just made so uncomfortable for them in the, in the family unit that it's safer and easier to be somewhere else. This separate life is just better for all the reasons. 
Or maybe you think you can't leave. Maybe even after all this time, you feel like you can't leave because your exclusion does this really important work to stabilize someone else. Well, spoiler, leaving is always an option. Or maybe you've been singled out to bear the symptoms of a family disease, those symptoms that come out usually in an individual as mental illness or addiction or isolation or aggression. Or maybe your family of origin is really healthy and put together, but you recognize actually this same dynamic in the relationship of racial and national and political identities in the United States today. I certainly see that parallel. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the answers in one sermon to broken, dysfunctional family systems. I don't have magic words that I can say, and the the work of healing those systems and even healing an individual life shaped by those systems, well, that road leads through usually therapy and physical health care and often a shift to a new supportive community. And if that's a road that you are on, I want to say that you are worth it that God loves you enough to walk down that road with you. My words can't directly heal and transform broken, dysfunctional family systems. The Holy Spirit heals those through relationships and professional training and changes of direction. The Holy Spirit heals those through what love looks like in human relationships and human communities. What I have to say today is a theological point. I want to say some theological words here to say that if you have been excluded from your human family, excluded, kicked out from that human family, I want to say that you belong in God's family. I don't mean that like a consolation prize, like, well, if you don't belong anywhere else, well, at least you can belong here. No, I mean... If you have been excluded, if you have been made to be the problem in those human relationships, you are exactly the one who belongs in God's family. That God comes specifically, explicitly to you as you have been excluded from that human family. We have these beloved stories from the New Testament that probably some of you wish I were reading instead. We have these beloved stories about Jesus seeking out widows and gathering a family beyond human boundaries. And we love those stories because they make sense because we just know that Jesus is super nice and does all the right things. And I think that's actually a limitation on those stories because we know that Jesus is super nice and does all the right things. It's like, smile, Jesus loves you, but then again, Jesus loves everybody. We can affirm those stories because they are undeniably true. Jesus comes to gather us together when we are excluded and marginalized, when we have no place to belong. And Jesus comes to gather those who are excluded and marginalized long before Jesus comes looking for people like me. So if I belong, we know that Jesus is coming to gather everyone else as well. And as we discussed last week, Jesus also comes for those who are just plain ignored. Whether or not that being ignored and looked over is part of that same family dynamic that we see going on today or not. Jesus comes specifically, explicitly to gather those who are excluded. And that is excellent news for everyone. And yet, it's easy to lose that good news because Jesus is perfect, and our families are not, not even mine. So there's grace in reading the whole Bible, grace in reading even stories like today's glimpse of this disastrously dysfunctional family, as we see God's promise extend beyond 
those dynamics of human exclusion. The first part of the reading, that was great news, wasn't it? God is faithful to the promise, and Sarah finally becomes pregnant and has this baby, Isaac, whose name means laughter. She says to God, you have given me laughter, and all who hear will laugh with me. And that's wonderful until Isaac's weaning party when Ishmael, the other son, is playing and laughing with Isaac, and Sarah just can't take it. You may know what happens already because you've seen this soap opera before, or you may know what happens because you know this from your own experience or the experience of someone very close to you. You know what happens when Sarah hears that other laughter. And the dynamic suddenly becomes, I cannot be happy as long as you are happy. And so as we saw last week, Abraham's family falls apart again. Abraham's family functions again and again by hiding and excluding the people who get in the way of Abraham's sense of identity. And that pattern is going to pass down through the generations to Isaac's family, to Jacob's family after him. Just when everything is working out, suddenly this conflict emerges and we have to exclude some certain family member. You may know that story all too well. It's horrific but predictable. Hagar and Ishmael are sent away with nothing and with nothing to do for themselves but to sit under a tree and wait for it until God shows up. Until God shows up. Now, God had been there all along, as we know. God has been present and intimately involved in Abraham's family all along. And I suppose... God is not surprised that Abraham's family turns out to be unhealthy again. It is possible to be unhealthy and still seek faithfulness all at the same time. But God is ultimately more faithful than we can be. God is ultimately more life-giving than we can be healthy. God has enough blessing for Ishmael as well as for Isaac. Without reading the whole story... This story looks like this perfect family celebrating the birth of a long-awaited child, and that's good news for them, and it's good news for whoever it is who has that perfect family out there. Don't raise your hands. But to find good news for everybody, we have to keep reading. To find good news for everybody, we have to look beyond that story at the story of Hagar and Ishmael as well, because this is also a promise for them. This is a promise of grace for them, not despite what has happened to them, but explicitly because of what has happened to them, because they were excluded by this unhealthy family. God never gives up. God never gives up on redemption. God never gives up on reaching out to gather us in, even and especially when the human beings around us fail even and especially when the human beings we are fail. Whether a biological or sociological family or a religious institution like a church or some other configuration of people, God is always seeking out those who have been excluded and pushed to the side. Which is to say that the promise is explicitly for you too. The promise is for you, too. You, who are excluded from a family or a social world, not despite that, but because God seeks you out. The the promise is explicitly for you as you seek to gather God's people back together again. This is why I love to see church communities that go out of their way to include one another, to include those who are excluded, to create a new family among those unlikely neighbors. And this is why I look beyond the church for that same thing, to see the connection and new life that God brings among those who were otherwise excluded because Christ is at work there too. 
And so we open our eyes and we see Christ's redemption in the world. Amen.